So welcome everyone, and thank you for joining tonight. Um, and for those who are just joining, this event is hosted by Neighbors on Call and FlipNC. Uh, I'm Amy, one of the co-founders of FlipNC. And first, just some quick housekeeping. If you have questions during tonight's event, please type them into the chat to the person named questions here. And thank you to volunteer Fran Grigsby for being the human behind the questions here, Square. Um, and we'll get to as many questions as we can at the end. So um, again, this, this is the fourth event in our series exploring how progressives can build a grassroots strategy for North Carolina. The first conversation we hosted as part of a series explored how the Wisconsin Democratic Party uh, was able to turn the tide and start winning elections in their state. As Susan mentioned, you can find those um, on their website. Next, we learned how organizations, activists, and advocates in Georgia deployed a strategy to expand the electorate and win at both the presidential and senatorial levels. And during the third event in this series, we heard from leaders of the North Carolina House um, Democratic Party and House and Senate Democratic Caucuses about what they have planned and how they're thinking about the work ahead. And across all these conversations and many others that we've been having less formally, uh, a recurring theme has been that we need to be out there organizing year round in communities, running voter registration, civic engagement, and talking with people to understand what their communities need and what issues are important to them. So for our fourth event tonight, we wanted to hear from folks who have been doing that work here in North Carolina over the past decade and who represent organizations that are leading the work on the ground. So a huge thank you to our panelists tonight for being so generous with their time and wisdom and to our fabulous moderator for facilitating tonight's conversation and to all the volunteers who are helping behind the scenes to make this event possible. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to my fellow Fabensi co-founder, Brianna, to introduce tonight's panel. Great. Thanks, Amy. Um, I am really excited to introduce tonight's panel and our moderator for the conversation this evening. When we started Flip and C back in 2017, one of the first people who reached out to us was Theo Lupke, who at the time was the America Votes North Carolina organizer. And he introduced us to what he called the progressive infrastructure in North Carolina. And we were just really impressed and grateful to learn about this network of organizations, professionals and advocates who were doing work year round to register and engage new voters, recruit and train candidates up and down the ballot, hold elected leaders accountable and to support and coordinate with grassroots groups across the state who were and are organizing in communities and around issues that are important to the people of North Carolina. These organizations are part of a landscape that we believe is essential to building a North Carolina that actually works for the people of our state. So it, it is now my privilege to introduce our panel and our moderator for tonight's event. Um, our first panelist is Serena Sebring. Uh, Serena is a queer, black, feminist, mother, organizer, and educator who works to support the power building strategies of Blueprint NC's partner organizations to demand a more inclusive democracy for North Carolinians. She brings leadership and vision to the coalition by strengthening relationships and strategic alignment of partners and coordinating resources and staff capacity in their service. Serena has 10 years of experience in power building, community organizing, policy campaigns, and base building. She previously served as regional organizing lead for Southerners on New Ground. She earned her BA in sociology from the University of Colorado at Boulder, her MA in sociology from Duke, and her PhD in sociology from Duke. Since 2005, she has woven and nurtured relationships across the state with organizers, artists, policymakers, workers, parents, and caregivers on front porches, in church basements, and city council rooms, at the state house, and in the streets. She currently serves as executive director of Blueprint NC, a statewide partnership of 55 and growing nonprofit organizations working together to ensure that all North Carolinians have a voice in our democracy um, uh, and a full share of its benefits. Blueprint focuses on strengthening collective voter engagement, executing a shared messaging strategy that mobilizes the public for a responsive democracy and enhancing partners' abilities to work together. Um, we're so grateful to have uh, Serena with us tonight. Our next panelist is Jessica Lawrence. Jessica has over 16 years of experience as an organizer, fundraiser, and strategist for progressive organizations and political campaigns. In her current role, she helps national and state donors direct resources to civic engagement and advocacy organizations across the state. 
She was North Carolina's America Votes Director from 2012 to 2018, and has also previously worked for Planned Parenthood, NARAL, and the Feminist Majority Foundation. She's originally from Alabama, but has lived in North Carolina for over a decade. And when she isn't working, she can be found trying to keep up with two little boys, one old dog, and one pandemic puppy. And I know from personal experience what it's like trying to do that. Um, our next panelist is uh, Elizabeth Kazel. Elizabeth is the North Carolina State Director for America Votes and has been with the organization since 2017. America Votes is a national organization working in 29 states to coordinate progressive organizations working to win campaigns and expanding access to the ballot for everyone. In North Carolina, the America Votes Coalition is made up of over 30 state-based organizations along the full spectrum of the progressive ecosystem from racial justice to environmental to pro-labor and women's reproductive rights groups. Prior to joining AV, she ran statewide environmental campaigns against fracking and offshore drilling. She got her start in 2010, organizing students in her home state of Mississippi. Elizabeth is from the Mississippi Gulf Coast, which has fueled her love for Southern politics and cheese grits. She lives in Raleigh with her husband and golden doodle, Freddie. And finally, um, Irene Godinez um, is our wonderful moderator tonight. Irene is a North Carolinian of Mexican heritage raised in Durham. She's the founder and executive director of Poder in Sea Action, a 501c4 organization that is building people power alongside young Latinxes across North Carolina. Poder leans into its cultural organizing to connect with its base and to mobilize towards independent political power that is grounded in principles, values, and love. Poder and C is pro-Black, pro-Latinx, pro-LGBTQ+, and pro-choice. Irene has worked for local, state, and national organizations on advancing immigrant and reproductive rights. Her work at issue-based nonprofits, coupled with her campaign experience and leadership coaching of elected officials, crystallized her mission to build equitable political representation for underserved communities and to create an intentional civic leadership pipeline for Black and Brown youth. Irene has 16 years experience in nonprofit management, community mobilization and engagement, lobbying, coalition building, advocacy, media relations, political strategy, and public speaking. She is a risk taker for justice, an office supply junkie, recovering perfectionist, and committed to nurturing spaces that enable others to show up authentically. She lives in plays in Raleigh with the most authentic person she's ever known, her five-year-old truth-telling daughter, Emerald. So with that, I'm going to pass the mic to uh, Irene to begin tonight's conversation. Thank you so much, Bree, and thank you everyone for joining. Um, I know that if I hear my baby's name right before I start anything, like it's very centering. So thank you for bringing Emmy into the space. Um, welcome everyone from across North Carolina. Um, we are so excited to have you here tonight. And uh, before we begin with this incredible panel that we have, I wanna do a little bit of storytelling. Um, and as I'm doing this storytelling, I want you to think about um, at what point was it that you um, jumped in and into the story? Um, so I'm gonna break it down into a few different uh, time periods. So in order for us to get to the North Carolina that we deserve, that our families deserve, where everyone's needs are, um, are made accessible, where voting is made accessible, where every person is able to ascend into their highest uh, vision of themselves, uh, we need to do a little retelling of how it is that North Carolina that we know today uh, came to be and especially what happened in the last 12 years to bring us to this place. Um, so in 2008, and I will also foreshadow that this is obviously storytelling from my perspective and how I've experienced North Carolina, but that's why I want you to think about where is it that you fit into this picture. Um, so 2008, 
an incredible thing happened. Uh, in 2008, this country elected Barack Hussein Obama to become our president. Um, in 2008, North Carolina turned blue for the first time in about 20, 30 years since Jimmy Carter. Um, this high that the whole country was on, um, I think, created a bit of a cloud over our eyes and thinking that we were in a post-racial country. Uh, we know now that that is far from the truth. It is far from where we are. Um, but nonetheless, 2008, we saw the election of our first Black president. Um, with that, there was the backlash and the backlash came in the form of the Tea Party and in the manifestation of over, of over 40 years of conservative organizing that was happening in the country. And with that came a kind of um, concerted effort to make sure that conservative values were suddenly um, front and center from everywhere at the local level. So school boards started to become um, a lot more conservative. Um, I recall in 2009, there was uh, a shift with the Wake County School Board and there was a lot of movement around that time um, because there was resegregation around economic boundaries that were starting to uh, come back front and center. Um, and so Tea Party takeover began in 2009 as a backlash to us having a black president, proving that we are far from post-racial. Uh, 2010, uh, that is when in North Carolina, we experienced Republicans, conservatives, um, taking a majority in our state for the first time in over a hundred years historians can fact check me, something like that. Um, and then in 2012, we saw that this continued concerted effort for conservatives to become more uh, in control of these uh, policies manifested in a supermajority here in North Carolina with the election of a Republican governor, uh, which had not happened in a really long time. With that supermajority, the erosion of voting rights began, uh, the erosion of access to voting. Um, and there had been so many games that had happened uh, prior to that, a lot of battles that were waged uh, by the beloved uh, Bob Phillips, uh, I'm sorry, Bob Hall at Democracy NC, uh, who was able to champion with a lot of other advocates um, access to the polls for young people. And a lot of those things started to be eroded by this new supermajority. So 2013 through 2016 was a very bleak time when, because of the supermajority, we saw a lot of um, really regressive uh, proposals being introduced and becoming law in North Carolina. Some of y'all may even remember Cookie Gate, uh, which was when Governor Pat McCrory came out to give a group of uh, Planned Parenthood supporters a plate of cookies, um, rather than sitting down and talking about uh, the uh, abortion uh, or the access, no, the closing down and the restriction on voting access or abortion access in North Carolina. Um, and then 2017 through 2018, uh, there was organizing that happened that, especially after the 2016 elections, um, 2016 gave us a Democratic governor, um, so a little bit of a, of a silver lining. And even still to this day, from 2017 to now, we're still uh, working towards getting more of these uh, regressive laws that passed off the books and also to move forward proactive legislation that can help our communities and also moving um, progressive electeds at the local level. Um, I jumped a lot in the for the last few years because I think that we're going to focus on that with our panel, but I just wanted to kind of give us a little bit of a met, uh, baseline for how it is that we got to where we currently are. So um, the first question that I would like to ask all panelists is, 
uh, and we can start with uh, Serena is, when did you step up to take meaningful action? And what was the issue that motivated you to get involved in movement work? Okay, um, hi, so nice to meet you all. My name is Serena, I use she and her pronouns. Um, it's such an honor to be here uh, with my colleagues and with you all to talk about how we win a progressive North Carolina for all of us. Um, on behalf of Blueprint, uh, it is really great uh, every opportunity that we get to talk about where we are going and how we get there. Uh, for me, my journey really began um, in grad school. So I came to North Carolina uh, to do a PhD in sociology at Duke, was very fortunate to find home in Durham and also to find a home in community-based organizing when I was invited to a potluck, uh, true Southern organizing style uh, at the home of one of my new friends and was introduced to what it meant to be part of something bigger than myself by becoming a member of Southerners on New Ground. Uh, that moment really was the uh, first um, in what would be lots of potlucks, um, and lots of miles on the road. Um, I spent about five years doing regional Southern organizing as a result, always clear on the fact that it is so important, so vital for us to find spaces of belonging so that we can grow power together. Um, and I'm really grateful to my home, Bull City, Durham, uh, for teaching me that lesson. Thank you, Serena. Yes, Bull City, um, Jessica. Yeah, so um, I became active in college, like running my student feminist organization and then uh, worked in, I'm originally from Alabama and then worked in Virginia. And so was really no stranger to uh, what right-wing majority could do in a state, moved to North Carolina in 2009, right before um, Republicans took over the state legislature here and, you know, sort of immediately knew what was about to happen um, from my experience in Virginia and living in Alabama. And so uh, knew that we were gonna have to mount a, a really robust defense if we wanted to protect all the things that we uh, love about North Carolina and create a path for it for the future. And so have been working to do that ever since. Thank you, Jessica. And finally, Liz. Um, yeah, I um, I would say I really got politicized uh, during the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. I uh, grew up in Mississippi, like Bree mentioned, and a lot of my friends were enlisting in the National Guard in order to be able to go to college or ensure that they could have a steady paycheck. And, um, you know, we're told these promises that they would never see active combat. And then we're, you know, the next year or even the next month getting shipped away to Iraq and Afghanistan for multiple tours. And I just thought that there was something not right about that. I didn't think that people should have to put their body on the line in order to get an education. And um, so you can imagine being a, a, an anti-war activist in Mississippi wasn't the, uh, the most welcoming place to be. Uh, so I found some activists uh, across the country and worked with them for a while, but really still felt like a tiny dot in a big sea um, and didn't quite think that like doing my own thing or voting was enough. And that's when I got introduced to organizing um, I started working uh, in college as well with, with students across the state um, and moved to North Carolina to continue that work in 2013. Excellent, thank you. And I'll just insert uh, moderator privileges and also share that for me, I got involved in 2005 during the battle for in-state tuition uh, for undocumented immigrants. And uh, that was when Democrats were in control of everything and that bill did not move forward. Um, and there were a lot of uh, things that were stripped away under Democratic uh, Party uh, leadership, including driver's licenses and things that our community is still uh, organizing around. So uh, thank you all so much. Um, I hope that for those of you who are listening that you heard a little bit of even your stories of how it is that folks got involved based on these issues that you care. And when an issue uh, rubs against, uh, when there is something that's happening externally that rubs against the value 
that is when we step up and we take action, right? And it sounds like a lot of y'all stepped up, especially after the 2016 elections. So just wanted to underscore that. Um, so Jessica, can you walk us through what type of ecosystem, including organizations and infrastructure, do you think are needed in order to create a state where all of the needs of our families are met, where people live in safety and where individuals can ascend into their highest potential? Yeah, I'd love to. And I'm going to share a little visual too, if y'all bear with me here, just a little bit of screen sharing. So I, I'm going to kind of go back to 2010, as Irene was describing, and note that in that year, two things changed the landscape in North Carolina. First, uh, as we've already talked about, uh, Democrats lost control of the state legislature. And that same year, not unrelated, the Citizens United decision came down from the Supreme Court and opened the door to unlimited political spending from uh, by corporations and unions. And a lot of people, when they think corporations, you know, we already know Walmart, the Koch brothers, all those folks, but corporations also include 501c4 organizations, so Planned Parenthood and uh, the League of Conservation Voters and unions like the AFL-CIO. So it opened the door to them to do their political work in a little bit of a different way. Um, and at the time, you know, progressive nonprofits in North Carolina were really structured to try and push the Democratic majority in the legislature more to the left. And so what that meant was we had a lot of lobbyists and most of our uh, capacity was in Raleigh, but we had almost no organizers and certainly not a statewide footprint that was capable of doing uh, year round voter engagement. Uh, but now Democrats were in the majority and we needed to do things really differently if we were going to stop the Republican onslaught on public education, on the environment, on workers, on LB, LBGTQ rights, voting rights, you name it. And so uh, collectively we set about building independent political organizations that could focus on the capacities that you see here um, on this slide. And we felt that these were the things that definitely had to be in place to build and maintain progressive political power in the state. So I'll just sort of go through them quickly. First, uh, real research and polling so that we could understand the opinions of uh, all the different kinds of North Carolinians across race and across place in the state. Um, and then second, uh, proactive news media coverage, aggressive, uh, uh, the aggressive ability to um, frame media coverage in the way that uh, we see the world. Um, candidate recruitment and training, to find our own folks, to get them trained and ready to run for office, policy development and advocacy, and a lot of what Serena and Liz are going to talk about, organizing and direct voter contact, the ability to be in conversation with North Carolinians about issues that matter to them, and uh, how candidates and elected officials are impacting those issues year-round, not just this sort of three months before the election. Um, and then aligned investment to help pay for all of that. But as we talk today, um, you know, there's going to be some important differences that you're going to hear us mention about how civic engagement and issue advocacy organizations and nonprofits do this work. Um, and I just want to note in our uh, ecosystem, there are what's called 501c3 organizations. Blueprint's one of those, and Serena's going to talk more about that. Um, another example you may have heard of is like Democracy NC or Common Cause. These organizations, it's really important to know, don't exist to win elections. In fact, they're prohibited from doing partisan political activity at all. Um, but what they can do is encourage people to participate in the political system. They can do nonpartisan voter registration. They can uh, do nonpartisan pushes to get out the vote, and they can take action to protect access to the ballot, protect our democracy. Um, they just can't do anything that would favor any candidate or political party. Um, and then we also have 501c4 organizations. And those organizations, which Liz will be talking about more tonight, they can do political work. They can advocate for or against a particular candidate. Um, but that can't be the only thing they do. They have to have 
some other purpose. And a lot of the time what you'll find is those organizations exist to advance policy on a specific issue. And they use their electoral work in service of that goal. So you're thinking about uh, Irene's organization, Poder NC Action, or an organization like League of Conservation Voters. That's a 501c4. Um, and their election work is designed to move the ball on their uh, issue work or build political power for their, consist uh, for their constituency. And then just one more thing I'll mention because we get asked a lot, how are you guys allowed to, or how do you coordinate with the Democratic Party? And so real quick, I'll just say the C3s don't because they can't, right? They're nonpartisan, non-electoral, and they don't exist to win elections. Um, but the C4s uh, can sometimes engage with the party and sometimes with Democratic electeds in limited circumstances, but we're forbidden by law from legally coordinating our electoral work with the party or with campaigns. So you might see Podair, for example, running a phone bank or running digital ads or a direct mail program and you'll think, why aren't they just doing that with the candidate? And it's because they're legally prohibited from doing so. So that's the answer to that question. Um, so yeah, that's just a little bit about our ecosystem. I'll turn it back to you, Irene. Thanks so much, Jessica. Um, and now starting with Serena, um, can you tell us a story or give us an example of when you've seen this ecosystem that Jessica described um, or the ecosystem uh, of blueprint um, working and how you know it was working? Absolutely. Um, first, just a little bit more about Blueprint to help folks understand what is a win for us. Um, we are really committed to building an anti-racist, um, inclusive democracy, and we know that it takes independent power to do so. Uh, so we have built a network of 55 and growing progressive organizations across the state that are committed in shared alignment around race equity, around collective impact, uh, around a broad set of issues. So we know that uh, inclusive democracy really requires open and reflective uh, and responsive governing institutions. We know that things like structural racism and economic inequality shrink and weaken the democratic process. Um, and we know that the way we can win, meaning gain full participation in this democracy is to build an infrastructure capable of shifting, not just policy, but also hearts and minds. Um, because there are some preconditions to democracy, right? Like we, we can't just arrive at full participation. Folks have to be able to have places to live, have food to eat, um, be able to recover from natural disasters that occur, um, and really to be safe in communities in order to participate fully in democracy. So we uh, build capacity for this amazing ecosystem. Uh, and one of the ways that that has shown up um, that I'm most proud of uh, is actually when, when COVID first, uh, first was announced and we were looking at a changing world right before our eyes. Um, so many of us uh, in the nonprofit sector wondered what would happen to our bases, to our organizations, to the leadership that we had built um, and really faced a situation where we might lose the, the tremendous ecosystem that has grown since 2010. Uh, and we were able to move money through our ecosystem in order to save um, jobs, in order to save the organizations that are smaller um, in a way that was responsive within weeks. And what we now know on the other side of that um, is that 55 organizations still have their doors open and we're able to participate in the largest voter turnout um, in history. And so we know that connections, um, that relationships built on trust and alignment made a difference in 2020. And we know that they will continue to make a difference in the times to come. Thank you so much, Serena. It was so powerful to see all the organizations collaborating and working to provide real support in our communities and meeting their direct needs first and foremost. Um, Liz, same question. Um, yeah, I I want to tell a story from last year and in 2020. I think many people know there was a pretty big effort uh, around vote by mail and a lot of confusion and a lot of people uh, were using that vote method for the very first time. And 
uh, you know, I think early on in the pandemic, we were concerned that, you know, it might not be safe for people to go and actually cast their ballot in person. Um, and so I think one example of this kind of ecosystem working well together is a couple of of things first, because we're, you know, one of our core missions, our primary purpose is to help expand access to the ballot. We were able to um, talk with key elected, you know, a key election administration stakeholders, including our C3 friends um, and some key officials within the party and the, and the actual um, state board of election. And so we were able to do advocacy uh, to make it easier for people to um, vote by mail. I think the second big thing is that we were able to do some or get some early information or get some information early on that um, there were going to be a lot of voters, particularly black voters in the state who were still going to prefer to uh, vote early and vote in person um, for various numbers of reasons. And so as a result, we were able to build a central strategy that helped drive people to the vote, the vote method that worked for them. Um, and so over the summer, we ran a big coordinated vote by mail program that essentially talked to uh, hundreds of thousands of North Carolinians about what vote by mail was, gave them their options for how that they wanted to vote and asked them to go ahead and make that plan. We coordinated that effort across uh, nine partners during the summer and were able to like get ahead of a lot of the misinformation that came out later on. Um, the second thing is that we were able to encourage uh, national partners who come in. So y'all probably maybe get a text from a group that you've given a donation to once or twice. It's a national organization right around election day. Uh, and maybe they don't know your polling location or maybe they get the wrong uh, information. So we were able to like pretty early on communicate with national partners as they were coming in and saying, you know, we're not disparaging early vote. We know that people want to use it. We're actually trying to just connect people with the vote method that works best for them. And so we were able to have a coordinated messaging strategy as well to help reduce uh, voter confusion, right? Because the last thing we want as, as organizations who are trying to win elections is to make it harder for people to vote. Um, and so I think that the coordination we were able to do early on in the advocacy with, our, with the various stakeholders, including our friends um, at the C3 table and the later program, we were able to coordinate and run across multiple partners and plug in national partners uh, was a really good example of, you know, everything kind of working how it's supposed to. Great, thank you so much, Liz. Um, and next question is actually to Jessica. Uh, what does it mean when people say that they are quote unquote expanding the electorate? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, like simply put, when we say that we mean, uh, doing the work to register new voters and engage uh, existing registered voters so that they actually turn out uh, to vote each election cycle. And uh, we think C3 and C4 organizations are really well suited for this kind of work, but we do it in particular context. Um, and the first part of that context is that we have we operate from a clear understanding that in North Carolina and across the country, there's been and continues to be a sustained effort to make voting very difficult or outright impossible for people of color, specifically for black voters. And so our work to expand the electorate is the work of standing outside the food line and collecting voter registration forms, but it's also um, to make sure that we are protecting voting rights so uh, that people have access to the ballot. And we're also very careful um, and uh, never blame voters for their own lack of participation, but instead focus on breaking down sort of the structural barriers that people face um, for full civic participation in the state. And then the second piece of context, which Serena alluded to a little bit in her first answer, is that we operate from an understanding that local uh, deep organizing that treats voting as just one piece of broader civic engagement work that people um, participate in as citizens of their state and country is a lot more effective than transactional sort of extractive work that drops into a community uh, a couple of weeks or months before an election, uh, once every two years. And so the organizations that work around our tables are building strong bases of support, they're developing local leaders, they're connecting people to issue and electoral campaigns 
that are generating um, real change in their lives and in their communities. And we are talking about voting with them as one part of that broader work, right? And so for us, that's how we get to real sustained, expanded political participation in North Carolina. Excellent. And it's so beautiful to see when our organizations are collaborating and um, and it leads us to these juicy moments like in 2018 as a C4 um, and having worked on uh, candidate recruitment and training and seeing so many of our candidates actually winning. Um, I think it gives a boost of energy to those of us who may sometimes think this isn't working, um, but, uh, and it gives us a little bit more energy um, to move forward. And with that in mind then, uh, Serena and Liz, can y'all talk about how your partners are making democracy accessible and to whom or for whom are they making it accessible, um, Serena? Absolutely. Uh, so. Actually, it, the story starts back a little in time again. Um, if we look back to 2010 um, and what has happened over the decades since then in terms of our commitment and power building uh, in terms of voter registration, we can see that the expansion of work has really um, relied on and benefited from site-based voter registration as Jessica was just mentioning, um, as well as a deep commitment to Eastern North Carolina. We learned a lot, frankly, from organizations in Eastern North Carolina in the, in the recovery work that they did after Hurricane Florence. We learned that actually trusted local messengers who were there when it mattered were the ones who were able to have tremendous success at not just registering voters um, who were considered low propensity, um, but also turning those folks out in the years to come. And so over the last 10 years, Blueprint Partners have collected over 460,000 voter registration uh, applications across the state. Um, our partners have been really thinking about geography, demographics, the partnership itself is diverse, which is what's required uh, in order to expand the electorate as we have been discussing. Um, we know that it's really important that our organizations that we work with are able to meet people where they are and where the need is. And that looks like people's living rooms, looks like barber shops, looks like church basements, uh, in 2020, it looked like meeting folks uh, in these places with PPE in hand and on and on, and our partners did it. Our partners expanded what it took um, in order to reach people, turning uh, voter outreach into wellness checks, um, expanding what we mean by civic engagement to include things like mutual aid. Um, and, and those are the kinds of things that have really made the difference at expanding an electorate um, we have doubled down uh, looking forward into um, our commitment in Eastern North Carolina. We know that that is where most of what are considered low propensity uh, voters, uh, black rural folks are, are located. We know that oftentimes national formations do not pay attention to the power of Eastern North Carolina, but Blueprint has learned that we do. Um, so we are committed to the local, uh, we are committed to the grassroots and we are committed to black rural folks in Eastern North Carolina. And if any of us are gonna win a full participation in democracy, it's gonna take all of us. That's what we have learned. Thank you so much, Serena. And where some people say um, low propensity voters, we will say high opportunity voters. We need to invest in dating people before they date us. Um, and that's the relationship with voters. Liz? Yeah, I'll start with the for whom and then go to the and go to the what. I would say that um, you know we're really committed to making sure that historically excluded folks in North Carolina have a seat at the table when it comes to voting. Um, and Serena already alluded to some of the folks that we're talking about, but we're largely talking about our BIPOC voters, Black, Indigenous, people of color, um, young voters, people who have been just historically left out of a process intentionally. Um, and so what our partners work to do is they work to reach these voters um, through their voter contact programs and then also working through a lot of a lot of our partners also do work um, in the democracy advocacy space. So what that looks like for us um, is a couple of things. One, 
Um, folks are doing things like advocating for early voting sites, making sure that they're engaging with their local county boards of elections to advocate for um, expanded early voting or ensuring or protecting early voting. Last year, you know, like I mentioned, we engaged uh, at the statewide level with the State Board of Elections, uh, really working on a multitude of issues, including uh, trying to stop uh, intimidation for voters at the polls. Um, our partners worked on trying to get poll workers uh, to polling locations so that they wouldn't be shut down. Um, and then we were also really engaged in the ballot cure process, like making sure that the voters who, um, well, before a ballot may need to be cured or you know, a vote by mail ballot may be thrown out, trying to walk people through an education process and make sure they had the information they needed to um, cast their ballot correctly. And then after the fact, uh, really following up with the folks that um, were unable to, to do that in a way that counted uh, to make sure that their vote actually counted. So a lot of this work is actually lives in this very robust uh, democracy advocate space that has many, many organizations, some of which have been named on this call um, tonight. And I think of America Votes as, as doing our piece to uh, mobilize our partners where it makes strategic sense and where we can make the biggest impact. Excellent. And uh, as Serena was describing the kind of work uh, that uh, Blueprint does and that the partners do, what the thought that came to my mind is, oh, you're treating people like people. And before you're coming and asking them to register to vote, you're actually saying, what a needs here. We saw a hurricane just happen. Let us uh, work together. You tell us how uh, you lead the way and we'll show up. Um, and so that to me means investing in uh, building people power. So can y'all tell us a bit more of how your partners are building lasting power in their communities and with the bases that they serve? Um, however, uh, I, let's start with Liz this time. Um, sure. Um, Irene, in your intro, when you were uh, talking about Poder, um, a big thing, a big word came up, which is building uh, independent political power. And that's what a lot of our partners are doing at the table. They are working on a county or even city or sometimes uh, census track local. Um, level and, you know, working to organize people uh, around issues that they care about or connecting them to really critical services that they need um, in order to build a cycle of civic engagement. Um, and the purpose of this for our partners is to eventually flex that political muscle. So, you know, we already see some folks able to do this. You know, I want to shout out Ricky Hurtado and Alamance County and uh, all of our partners in Alamance, like Poder down home and and uh, Siembra and others who were able to like, you know, from our perspective, really throw down in a race um, that was pretty hard. Um, and, and that's what our partners are trying to do. They're working to build and organize um, their people so that our people can get an office um, and that we have the leaders that we want and that are reflective of our democracy. Um, and that's what a lot of our, our partners are doing at the table year round. Thank you, Liz. Shout out to Lead NC for recruiting Ricky Hurtado. That is the kind of gem that we have across North Carolina, all across the state. And thank goodness there's an organization focused on recruitment. Serena. Oh, well, real quick. I have to also be remiss. Also, many people on this call canvassing for him too. So thank you for y'all's work. Uh, I know on both sides. So uh, sorry, just wanted to say that before I hand it over to Serena. <laughs> well, shout out to all the many hands on the Freedom Plow. Um, we are really clear that it's going to uh, continue to need us to keep doing what we're doing uh, in many ways, and that is um, to uh, build this partnership uh, that really reflects the communities that we are trying to register. Um, we know that those uh, leaders are going to be people of color, going to be BIPOC folks. Um, we know that those organizations that hire the, this leadership need to operate year round, um, cannot rely on an electoral cycle in order to sustain the leadership that we need to build participation. We also know that it's a fierce combination of uh, both trusted local organizations and trusted local messengers providing what is really critical and that's culturally competent uh, outreach. We know that not um, all outreach is the same, only an AAPI organization really could understand um, how the community is not a monolith um, and what it looks like to meet the diverse needs of a particular community. 
Uh, and we know that if we want to expand the electorate to include more AAPI folks, more Black folks, more rural folks, then we are going to need people and organizations that reflect those communities to be an authentic conversation. Um, it is not gonna be a one and done and there's no quick fix for really pulling people into a process of an inclusive democracy. So we're really doubling down, as I said, in our uh, commitment to Latinx outreach as well. Um, and we know that this is gonna carry us over the next two years towards collecting a minimum of 200,000 uh, voter registrations across the state of North Carolina in 2021 and 2022. That is roughly 30%. So we're gonna try and get a third uh, of the 650,000 eligible unregistered uh, people of color in North Carolina. And we know that we need to resource we need to resource every element of a progressive ecosystem in order to do that. Uh, and so that is what we are telling people who ask what we need. We need to resource every element of a progressive infrastructure to do that. Excellent. Thank you so much, Serena. Um, we are getting some really juicy questions. So I'm gonna throw the first one out to Jessica. Um, and the first one is, um, how is work coordinated? You touched on this a little bit, um, but how is work coordinated with the party? Can you provide an example? Yeah. Um, so it is only coordinated in circumstances in which it's legally allowed. So um, I'll give one example that's allowable. When we are um, doing issue advocacy during the legislative session, we are uh, you know, when one of our um, America Votes partners is working on a piece of legislation or working to block a bad piece of legislation, we're allowed to work then uh, with both the party and the legislative caucuses on that effort. When we are um, not allowed to coordinate with them is in the fall of election years when the C4 organizations um, are running uh paid communications or door-to-door -door operations where they are actively advocating for or against the election of particular candidates, right? So the what Citizens United said was you can spend unlimited money, but the, um, the limitation is you can't coordinate that spending with the party or with campaigns. And so essentially we, um, we basically stop communicating at that point. We don't even see each other socially. There's no communication at all. And then we meet again after the election. And once things have already happened, we can debrief them, talk about what worked and what didn't. Um, and we can think about um, sort of best practices. One other place where we are legally allowed to communicate is aligning around candidate recruitment um, and training, thinking about where uh, we need to do recruitment and sort of generating a pool of good candidates and working to find the best people to run for office. Um, so we do communicate about that and work to reduce duplication. So it's just in that sort of three months before the election that um, we are not allowed to communicate with each other. Thank you. And uh, Serena, this question is for you from an participant, um, are there groups mobilizing hospitals and health clinics across North Carolina to do C3 voter registration? Great question. None that I'm aware of, but I would love to research it and get back to you. Thank you. And uh, this is for any of the three of y'all. Um, how are you using data to guide your strategy? Um, I'm happy to take that first. I would say that we data is the uh, foundation for how we build our electoral campaign. So post 2020, we did a really exhaustive election analysis and we looked at, you know, we use a series of models and polls to help us figure out exactly who the voters are that we need to be, well, not exactly, but as well, as best as we can, the voters uh, who we need to be talking to and what types of messages they need to hear. And so post-election, we, we test all that. We say how, you know, if we had a turnout model, uh, you know, people have used the word propensity on here. I know that several of y'all are familiar with those types of terms. Uh, our low propensity voters or high opportunity voters, as Irene said, and I love that, 
uh, are they actually, uh, did they vote? Like what was the, you know, what was the uh, election results? And we did a really exhaustive um, a director's cut as our data director likes to call it, uh, slide deck around uh, the election. And what that showed us was uh, things that y'all have already heard, um, you know, Amy and others talk through, uh, through these series as well is that, you know, our uh, urban areas are growing more uh, progressive and we actually have a real opportunity in these ex-urban areas or what we call suburbs and regional city centers to uh, start really, you know, chipping away and gaining ground for progressives that, um, you know, with investment in places like Cabarrus County, continued investment in Alamance, those places uh, that are surrounding some of these, you know, major urban hubs uh, are, are places where, you know, that's where our next kind of battleground is. Um, and then it also showed us that like, we can't just forget about the rural areas. Like Serena said, you know, uh, it's death by a thousand cuts out there. Without investment um, in our rural counties, you know, we can't expect voters to show up and continue to deliver statewide or local victories if we're not gonna show up for them, you know, the other 364 days of the year. Uh, so all of that is bears out in our data. That's how we've built our strategy for this year um, and how we've done it in, in all the years I've been in AB. Uh, and if I can for, just, oh, sorry, go ahead, Jessica. No, go ahead. I was just going to add one quick thing, which is to say, similar to how uh, those of you who have worked with the party or on the party side are familiar with Vote Builder as the sort of voter file of the party, we have a very similar database on the independent side. And so all the partners who are working with Liz um, uh, are able to share data in uh, information about conversations that they are having with voters at the door or on the phone. Um, there's a voter file for the C4s and then a separate voter file for the C3s. We have to keep that information separate, but uh, it's shared across partners. So uh, it's pretty efficient uh, in that way. And, and um, I would add that on the blueprint side, our partners over the last 10 years have built a universe of 2.1 million contacts. They are primarily uh, BIPOC, they're primarily uh, rural, uh, and we turned out 71%, approximately 71% of that universe in 2020 and hope to uh, push both those numbers up over the next few years. Yes. Um... So the next one is real talk question from an audience member uh, of the structure that y'all outlined for progressive organizing uh, goes back 10 years. Uh, how can we understand the limited electoral success over the same period? I'm gonna throw it to you first, Jessica. Yeah, I'll take that one. So I resist the word limited. Um, while still being realistic about the shortcomings of 2020. So if uh, we remember 2010 uh, and we you know, know that shortly after 2010, we not only lost the governor's race and a majority on the state Supreme Court, but the Republicans got super majorities in the state legislature that allowed them to do whatever they wanted uh, for a couple of years there. Uh, and then think about collectively uh, how we all scrapped to get out of that hole, the independent infrastructure uh, and the party and the candidates who put their names in the ring, right, to run. Um, and that in that time, we were able to reclaim the governor's mansion, to reclaim a majority on the state Supreme Court, to defeat two very pernicious constitutional amendments that were added to the ballot at the last minute um, and to break the supermajority in the legislature. Uh, I think that we all have a lot to be proud of um, and to sort of raise our heads about because uh, as we've all talked about, there was almost no ability to combat this Republican onslaught at the end of 2010 uh, and you know, now, you know, we've been able to stop a lot of things and regain a lot of ground. We are not satisfied, right? Like we wanted uh, and worked very hard to try to take back the state legislature and are going to need to continue to do so for the next decade. And it is going to be um, a hard fight and it's going to need everybody's hands on deck as, uh, as Serena was mentioning. So 
you know, I, I'm not, I don't, I'm not Pollyannish about like what happened last year, but I'm also unwilling to say that we've had limited electoral success because I don't think that's the story of North Carolina. Accurate. Serena. We we'll just add like, let's be clear about what we've been up against. We started with the building of the Tea Party infrastructure um, and that didn't go anywhere. <laughs> They've also been organizing, right? So we know that the Tea Party led to the growth um, of, a, of a right extremist and white supremacist movement um, that poked its head up from the rocks really clearly uh, during this electoral cycle. We know that our partners had to overcome not just COVID to turn people out, but had to overcome, in fact, terror, uh, which has grown in an increasingly volatile uh, political climate to include things like we saw uh, in Reopen NC movement, bringing out folks like the Oath Keepers uh, to the, the doors of our, our elected officials, knowing that the next time we saw those folks, we saw them at the polls and they had militia gear on and they had uh, clarity about the kinds of intimidation that that movement has practiced that led directly to the insurrection of January 6th. And we also know that nine buses of North Carolinians went from North Carolina up to DC to participate in that. Uh, and so when we talk about what will it take to win more than we have, it will take attending, yes, Irin, to the people, to the people. We have to protect people at the polls uh, if we want folks to show up. And to do that, Blueprint's ecosystem had to really step in uh, to provide people power, and we'll need to continue to learn the lessons of where the threats to our inclusive democracy are across our state. Um, and we know that our ecosystem responded. So over uh, the course of 70 counties with 90 partners, we held 750,000 voter protection events in 2020. Um, that required the training in things like de-escalation, community care and intervention um, of hundreds of organizers across the state. It will take that kind of coordinated attention to community-based safety by community uh, for this to be an authentic democracy. And that is what it will take to bring more folks out. Thank you. And yeah, and I would just I would just add kind of uh, two quick things. I know we're almost at time. Um, I think the the first thing I want to say too is you know plus one to what Jessica said around uh, you know looking at the trends over time. And then the other thing I would say is that demographics aren't destiny. Like we have to go out and make the case to voters um, on across the political spectrum. And we're also a state that needs white voters in order for Democrats to win statewide. And there are a lot of white voters out there politicized or tempted to be politicized around the right's attempt to uh, racialize uh, our politics. And it's our job as white folks to go out and have those conversations with our neighbors, with our friends, with our family, people, you know, maybe not the Oath Keepers that, that Serena's talking about, but the folks that you know uh, in your networks that, um, you know, are, are maybe listening to CNN about critical race theory right now and have a lot of questions. Um, and you could maybe be a voice to help pull them over and make sure that they vote uh, the right way come next year. So that would be the last thing I would add. Thank you. And I'm gonna just tie it up a, a little bit before I pass it on over back to Bree that in the last 10 years, we've also seen, uh, we've gone from having one Latinx elected official to 12. We have 12, including uh, judges. Uh, we also went from having, I believe, just one or two Black sheriffs in the state to now, in 2018, eight Black sheriffs were elected um, who had been held accountable, are being held accountable by community, especially some of the folks that were um, uh, organized through um, our community groups. Um, we have also seen um, that what Serena was talking about, some of these buses of the nine buses, at, several of them were being, um, the folks that were recruiting for those buses are literal legislators. They are sitting as elected leaders 
in the North Carolina legislature. And the fact that y'all are here is a resistance to us ceding our state over to people who do not value the humanity of those of us on this call and our families and friends. So I think that tonight is a manifestation of the victory that we're still here. North Carolina has a legacy, a strong legacy of resisting, of fighting back and pushing back. Also, we have a strong legacy of organizing um, and and uh, if we continue, so my call to action to each of y'all is to, uh, before you go to bed tonight, reach out to a friend, let them know what you participated in tonight and ask them to join you on the next time that you take action somewhere. This is how we begin to do change and make change happen in our communities. It's relational. It's people will show up if you ask them to show up. Don't be afraid of their rejection. Uh, if they care for you and care for our families and communities, they will show up. Keep asking as well. So back to you, Bree. Thank you so much. Um, we wanna say thank you um, to Irene Godinez um, for grounding and contextualizing and facilitating this inspiring and powerful conversation. Um, you did a great job and um, you know, couldn't have um, done it without you. Um, and thank you so much to our panelists, to Jessica Lawrence, to Sabrina, Serena Sebring, and Elizabeth Kazel, um, all of you for your time and for sharing your knowledge and your vast experience um, in North Carolina with us tonight. I know I speak for, on behalf of, of everyone here when I say how much we appreciate um, the work that all of you and your partner organizations are doing in North Carolina. Um, we wanna say thank you to the, the wonderful community that's gathered here tonight. Um, we have elected officials, we have community leaders, party leaders, um, hardworking volunteers and supporters on this call. And we wanna thank you for taking the time to join us. Um, wanna uh, ask you to take three additional next steps um, in addition to um, the call to action um, from Irene. Um, please keep an eye out for a follow-up email from Neighbors on Call tomorrow. Um, uh, we also very much value your feedback and we're gonna send a short survey on um, an email. We would really appreciate it if you would um, fill that out so we can get your feedback. And finally, please stay tuned for some upcoming announcements for ways that you can be involved in our collective work to build a North Carolina that works for everyone. Um, we know you're all here because you're already involved and engaged, um, but there is a lot at stake in the next two, 10 um, and beyond years. And uh, we really need everyone. So um, thank you all for being here, thanks to our moderator and our panelists, um, and a special thanks to the tech crew behind the scenes, uh, Shelby Clay, Ian Gardner, and Diane Ong. Um, great work, everyone. Um, and thanks everyone for being here. Good night.